So we're going to jump into our study that we've been in on Wednesdays. Um, it's the, coming somewhat from a book entitled Winning with People. And I will say to you, uh, if you have never read that book, I've talked through it a few years ago, probably eight or nine years ago. Um, if you have not read that book, I encourage you to buy that book and read it. It's not written uh, with Bible verses in it in a Christian perspective. It's written to the secular world. The guy who wrote it used to be a pastor, but um, it is a very valuable book and profitable, in my opinion anyway, uh, for us as Christians as we uh, try to learn to live for the Lord. Because we have to realize that our ability to make relationships with other people uh, is going to have a huge impact on whether or not we can reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I learn how to connect to people and, and, and truly bridge a gap between me and them through a relationship, I can then uh, share Jesus with them. And in the day and age, I talked about this in my class the other day at the college with the guys in the class. Um, used to, we lived in a world where you could just present the gospel to somebody, but those opportunities are very few and far between now. We have to uh, establish some type of a uh, rapport with people, a relationship almost with them, before we get a chance to share Jesus. And if we're not careful, here's what we do. And now this is not what we're talking about tonight, but let me just go ahead and take this little spiel moment, momentarily here. Um, if we're not careful, what we will do is we will put all of our efforts into the relationship and we will never uh, go to the next level or take the next step to present Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful that we don't just get into relationship mode and do all things to preserve relationship status with another person uh, and neglect the gospel. But it is necessary, uh, necessary to share the gospel that we build relationships with people. Then there's a whole other uh, aspect or layer to this as well. In the church, in the church family, who we are, where we are, in order for us to uh, relate to one another, to serve one another, to communicate with one another the way we're supposed to do, in order for that to happen, we have to be able to deal with one another and communicate with one another and love one another and have relationships with each other. That has to happen. The Bible over and over again uses the words uh, one another. And usually when that word's used in the New Testament, is talking about how you are to relate to your brother and sister in Christ. God's very concerned with how we can communicate with each other. And if we're not careful, we will neglect each other and we will do things that keep us from being able to minister to the others. And that's one bad part of it as it relates to church family. But then the secondary part of that is there's going to be times when you need these folks in here. You know what I'm saying? There's going to be times when you need these brothers and sisters in Christ. And the truth of the matter is, if you do not have a relationship with them, then when you need them so desperately, you're not going to be able to utilize the, the thing that you're supposed to have, that connection you're supposed to have with them. You will not be able to utilize that because you do not have a relationship with them. We do a lot of things as individuals sometimes that ostracizes us from others. It keeps us from being friends with other people. And it's simply because sometimes there's just things we do that are not the right things. We don't think the right way. We don't act the right way. We don't talk the right way to other people. And the biggest problem, if you're with me, say I'm with you. The biggest problem often is we don't think the right way about situations. So it's so important we understand how this is supposed to take place. The notes tonight that we're going to go over uh, come under the heading of the trust question. And here's uh, what the question is that the book introduces to us. And then we're going to kind of depart from there on some things. But he, said, he asked this question. Can we build mutual trust? Can we build trust with other people? He writes in the book, he says, you may not know what trust is, but you know what it isn't. If people lie to you, steal from you, or physically harm you, then you know you can't trust them. That's very true. Well, when it comes to relationships, the very first principle under the trust question is this. It's called the bedrock principle. And here's what it states. You must build a foundation of trust for a relationship to rest upon. In other words, there has to be trust between two people. 
in order for there to be a relationship or there never be one. By the way, in a marriage, let's just talk about that for a second. In a marriage relationship, if there's no trust between the two, then there will not be a good marriage because that trust that I have with my wife and she has in me, that trust that we have, that confidence in one another that we have uh, is a big part of our relationship. And if I can't trust her or if she can't trust me, then automatically there's going to be a breakdown in our relationship. Trust is a very important part. He calls it a, the bedrock principle. Proverbs chapter 25 says this, verse 19. Proverbs 25, verse 19. It says, Confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Now, Proverbs, Solomon often draws us some very interesting pictures with his words, and in this one he definitely does that. He said, confidence in an unfaithful man, in other words, an untrustworthy man, he says, is like a broken tooth. What does that mean? Somebody talk to me. What does a broken tooth mean? That's painful, man. It's, you, you bite down on something with a broke tooth, and it hurts all the way through, right? Through and through. Or a foot out of joint. What does that mean? You can't walk. I mean, a foot out of joint, what are you going to do with it? Just look at it, right, and carry it around. Um, the picture there is, is that if you trust someone who is uh, an unfaithful individual, then that is going to cause you harm. So how do you build relationships with people? How do you establish a bedrock principle as it relates to uh, your brother and sister in Christ and then also people out in this world? Trust must be built. The writer in the book says, like a bank account, you must make deposits into trust often into your bank account often, deposits of trust into your bank account often. And by making these deposits, you then uh, earn the trust of other people. And then if you make a debit out of that account, it takes a while to replenish what you withdrew. That is the picture he draws. And what he means by that is, is that we should set out in, in our dealings with other people in such a way as to establish an atmosphere of trust. I was uh, in, in, in my doctrinal studies recently, I had to do interviews, and I did an interview with a pastor who said, uh, I, I was asking questions about how to uh, lead a church and how to establish a great commission focused in the church. That was the, the subject matter of this discussion. And, uh, and I said, are there things that you do that enable you to lead this church in this way? And he said this, he said, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, I, I get change in my pocket. Undoubtedly, one of the speakers, uh, one of the guys who writes books says that, I get change in my pocket. He said, uh, when I first became their pastor, I painted the auditorium. That's what he said. He painted outside the auditorium. And he said, and after I did that, it looked really good. It, it got me some change in my pocket. And everybody's like, man, it looks good. And they were proud of it. And they were thankful for it. And he said, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And the, the picture he drew for me as I sat and listened to him was, is that you gain people's confidence by your faithfulness and your wise living. As you make wise decisions, you gain their confidence. And they come to the place where they trust you. Is that true? It is. Just think about this. I have, since I've been here as pastor for almost nine years, there's so many things that we've done. I mean, I couldn't even list them all because I wouldn't remember them all. So many thousands of dollars we spent. Think, that dude doesn't spend a bunch of money over at that church down the road. He doesn't spend all their money, right? Yeah. A lot of thousands of dollars. But if I would have walked in here day one and said, hey guys, we're going to spend $40,000 and we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this this week, that would have never flown, would it? Y'all would have been like, what's wrong with it, dude? <laughs> right? Y'all would have been like, what's wrong with him? You have to gain, earn trust. That's very important. So as it relates to us being connected to other people, we have to intentionally do things that will help them, enable them, cause them to trust us. A couple things from this. First, you must show yourself trustworthy. You must show yourself trustworthy. If you want to build relationships with others, then you have to prove to them that they can have confidence in you. If they question you, if they wonder... Are you going to go repeat this thing that I'm about to tell you? If that's how they feel, then they can't trust you. And if they can't trust you, then they really can't build a relationship with you. One of the worst things you can do as far as building trust with people is violate their confidence. If, um, 
John. <laughs> you see, he's the closest one. Brian's not here to pick on tonight. Sorry, John. So it's you, right? Uh, if John came to me and said, Pastor Tim, I want to talk to you. And he sat down and shared his heart with me, some things going on in his life right now. And then right after that, we walked over here, and I got up in the service and said, y'all pray for a young man that goes to South Asia that goes to our church at least singing here sometimes. He's got these terrible struggles in his life, right? <laughs> well, that may not be how we violate trust. That may not be exactly how. But how often do we say, listen, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell nobody else. Well, if you told somebody, then you already violated the trust. Be faithful. Be dependable. Be trustworthy. Secondly, not only do you need to yourself set out to be trustworthy and dependable person in order to gain, to establish relationships with others, you need to also look for trustworthiness in others. Look for people that you can really rely upon, especially as a young person. I'm sure this is true of old people as well, but especially as a young person. Look for people that you can truly grow with and they can encourage you and help you. People that will cause you to do the right thing. Look for friends to hang around and surround yourself with that will say, Hey, you shouldn't do that, Blaine. Hey, Blaine, that's not what you're supposed to do. Or somebody will say, Hey, did you read your Bible today? Somebody that will encourage you in your Christian walk. Look for people who are trustworthy to be your friends. Things that trust requires first it requires that the person who's going to be trusted has character. And then secondly, it requires our willingness to forgive. The reason I threw that last one in is because you're going to have to forgive anybody who is your friend. Is that true? It is. Because everybody's going to need forgiveness sometimes. How would a marriage relationship ever work if forgiveness was never granted? Think about that. How many times your wife or husband had to forgive you this week? Right? I mean, my wife hadn't had to forgive me, but I had to forgive her a whole bunch of times, right? How many times? In order to be good friends, you have to be good forgivers. Forgiveness is required and character is required. Secondly, as it talks about uh, building trust with others, the second thing he says is the situation principle. He says, never let the situation mean more than the relationship. You probably have heard that before. I'm going to throw you a different twist on it in a moment, I think. Never let the situation mean more than relationship. The Bible says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. Uh, it says, Be ye kind one to another. What does kind mean? I thought about that today. What is kindness? What does that mean? It probably would have a very long definition if we tried to list every aspect of it. But ultimately, I think of it as, How would I want that person to treat me? What would I want them to do to me? And then secondly, when I'm talking about kindness, kindness, sorry, um, what, what is it that, uh, how, how would I want them to view me and, and talk to me and treat me? Would I want them to be respectful? Would I want them to show me loving kindness? Would I want them to be humble as they talk to me and as they dealt with me? And the answer to those questions is absolutely I would. Don't let the situation mean more than the uh, relationship. Too often we do this. When we have kids and, and there is an uh, issue, we jump in head over heels into a situation where it's not necessary and we cause irreparable damage because of something that probably wasn't even that important because we make something more important than our relationship with our child. Someone has said, uh, you can be right or you can be liked. And um, that's not from the Bible that I know of, but that's pretty that's some pretty good truth there. You can be right or you can be liked. But, uh, we are to learn to be Christ-like as we deal with other people. Honor the Lord in your dealings with others. Are there instances, here's a question for you, where relationships must be severed or sacrificed? Talk to me about that. Are there instances where relationships must be sacrificed, and if so, how? Talk to me about that. Hmm? Somebody said, yeah. Don, I think that's you. Go ahead. Okay. All right. When maybe there's a negative impact upon you from a person, okay? Is there other times when relationships, because we started out saying 
uh, never make a situation more important than a relationship. Now I'm reversing it and saying, are there times when you have to make situations more important than relationships? Anybody else? Another example there. Um, I think also, anybody else got an idea there before I talk? Go ahead, Brother Marcus. It changes for sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Go ahead, Mr. Steve. Okay, thank you. Because that's one of the things that I was definitely working towards. Situation where somebody's going to be harmed physically. Yeah, you do have to. And also, uh, this goes into the church world. Uh, when truth is at stake. When truth is at stake. Uh, we, we, you know, we do want to be able to get along with others in the religious world. We do want to be able to communicate or to work together with others to accomplish the goals that God has set before us. We want to do that. But if truth becomes the thing that's at stake, we have to be willing, we have to be willing, and we have to sever relationships when that becomes the situation. That's why, like, all the religions in the world can't get together and sing Kumbaya and go do all the good things. We can't. We can't. Because then we have forsaken truth and we cannot forsake truth. Now, can I work? Can I hang out or, or work alongside the guy who, uh, you know, uh, parts his hair different than mine? Yes, we can. Right? There's things that we have to be willing to overlook for the sake of the cause in the, in the relationship. But when truth is at stake, we cannot, we cannot sacrifice truth for relationship. Even in the church world, the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that there are times, even in the church, when what we call church discipline takes place, where we take a sinning and erring brother who refuses to repent and will not get right, and we sever their relationship with us and put them outside of the church. That's taught clearly in Scripture in Matthew chapter 18. It's taught, taught clearly in Scripture in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's taught clearly that that has to happen. So are there times when, yes, you do have to sever a relationship? Yes, there are. But the ultimate goal in most of our dealings should be we want to always, we want to salvage the relationship. With family, and that's your family in your house, your, your kids, your husband, your wife, and also there's people outside the house. Those are more difficult people, aren't they? Sometimes they're very difficult people. But the ultimate goal should be to salvage relationships because the relationship is a conduit through which we're going to try to get Christ to people because we're living for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. So I'm thinking in those terms all the time. So before I let them have it or tell them off or let them have a piece of my mind, I realize there's something way more important here that's at stake than my pride and my feelings. You don't sever relationships over feelings. Right? You don't sever relationships over our pride and our arrogance. You don't sever relationships because of something you assume. Uh, last week, a statement he that I said last week, I think it came from the book, um, we want people to judge us based upon our motives. We want people to, we want to judge other people based upon their actions. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. So can we build a relationship? Can we have or create a mutual trust between us? First, we talked about the, the bedrock principle. Trust is the bedrock of a relationship. Secondly, we talked about the situation principle. We cannot let uh, the, the situation mean more than a relationship in most cases. I'm correcting our bro here. Okay, in most cases. Thirdly, 
the Bob principle. This is one of my favorite parts of this whole book. There's two parts. One of them we covered earlier, and this is my second favorite one, the Bob principle. Listen to what the Bob principle says. When Bob has a problem with everyone, Bob is usually the problem. All right, that's some great words of wisdom. When Bob has a problem with everyone, Bob is probably the problem. He says a few things about Bob. He says, first, Bob is a problem carrier. He said that somehow or another, Bob always carries the problem. He mentioned a time when he was the pastor and he was in board meetings. He was a new pastor in the church and he would have his board meetings and uh, with his deacons and others. And, um, and, and multiple times in the beginning of his years there, uh, someone would say, uh, there's people in the church that have a problem with such and such and whatever that you're doing and blah, blah, blah. And then some other guys in that meeting would also say, yeah, someone told me the same thing. There are people in the church. So that made the pastor be very concerned. And he said, first of all, I did some, uh, some self-reflection to think through, okay, what have I done? Is this something that I need to... And by the way, we should always check ourselves when there's criticism given, right? Always. If you don't, that means you're arrogant and you, you won't listen to anybody else and you're prideful. That's what that means. You've got a problem. We should always self-reflect and see if there's something wrong when we have criticism given. But then secondly, uh, after that, he said, you know, I've really thought about this. I've prayed about it. I don't think I'm doing anything wrong here. So, again, something else will come up, something else will come up, and every time one guy would say, yeah, people, if someone's come to me about that, and other guys in a meeting would say, someone's come to me about that as well. So, finally, uh, he decided one day, there in a meeting, that same scenario happens, and he says, okay, will you please tell me who it was that came to you about that issue? And here's what he discovered. Every one of those guys who said someone has come to me as well, the same person had come to each of them. It wasn't a bunch of people in the church that had a problem. It was one person in the church that had a problem. Bobs are problem carriers. You have to be careful. Not only that, but Bobs also are problem finders. Uh, my wife said this recently, and I don't know where she got it from, but she said, uh, I'm adding Bob to the statement. Bob could find the, the cloud with every silver lining. Right, with every silver lining. Yeah. Is that what you said? You don't know? <laughs> Bob could find the cloud with every silver, silver lining. Um, you know, we say every cloud has a silver lining. Well, this Bob could find the cloud that goes along with the silver lining. They're pro he's a problem. Uh, he carries problems, and he finds problems. And then he's a problem creator. He can't get along with anyone. You can't get along with anyone. That's a sad statement to make about somebody, especially a Christian. That should not be true. It should not be true of you. We should set out to try. My verses here, by the way, Hebrews twelve fourteen, follow peace with all men. Romans twelve eighteen, if it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. We should set out to live at peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should plan to. That should be our goal. And the rare exception should be that there's somebody in this house that you can't get along with. That should be the rare exception. And if that rare exception should happen to occur, then you should be daily, moment by moment, praying about that and working on that. And it should bother you greatly. If there's somebody that you can't love and care for and pray for in your own church family. But then that goes beyond the church because the truth of the matter is if we're going to be a light that shines in a dark world, then we have to go out there. And if I can't get along with anybody out there, if everywhere I go there's a problem, then ultimately I need to realize the problem is probably within me. Now thankfully, by God's grace, that does not mean that I am forever doomed and despaired and agonied forever and ever and ever because of that. All that means is I need to realize that's the problem, and then I need to set out as a Christian, as a godly man or a godly woman or a godly young person, I need to say, I've got to fix this. There's something wrong here. God, what's wrong? And then go through the process of trying to discover 
what's taking place in my heart? Why is this happening all the time? Why can't I not get along with anybody at work? Why can I never get along with my neighbor? Why do I always have conflict with everybody else? We've got to ask those hard questions sometimes. Because those types of questions will cause us to begin to look at the true situation, figure out what's wrong. And if you'll trace that, if you'll begin to do that process, and you'll begin to go down that street in your own life, you will discover sooner or later, okay, here's where all this stems from. Here's the cause. Here's the problem. And then you can deal with that problem. But that takes a lot of soul searching, prayer, letting God just, just make you be real. Let God search your heart. But we have to deal with that. Because otherwise we become repellent instead of attracted to Jesus Christ. So, if you happen to be a Bob here tonight, by all means, you're not doomed, but you do have a lot of work to do. Do something about it. If every thought that you have about everybody and every situation is always negative, they got something, there's something wrong with your thinker. Because every situation and every person and everything is not always bad and negative. It's not possible. It's not possible. Figure out why you think that way. Ask God to change you. One of the... I had many battles as a young Christian. Many of them. I had lots of issues. I still got issues. Right? I had lots of big issues when I was a new Christian. I came to Christ. He saved me. And then as He does, when He saves us, He begins to work on us and to change us and to shape and mold us. And that's supposed to be a lifelong process. Well, it wasn't long into my Christian life that I was confronted face to face with my negative critical spirit about everything. I was just a negative, mean person. I was confronted with that. And I was mad at first because I'm like, who do you think you are telling me that? And it was my brother that told me, by the way, and I felt like smacking him around. I probably should have, but no. I was mad. It really made me mad. And by the way, when you confront somebody with a a situation like that, it probably is not going to be greeted with, thank you so much for being so honest to me. I appreciate that. That's probably not what you're going to get. But then I had to go, I had to, I had to live with myself. So then I walk away from the situation mad, grumbling mad. And I, who does he, what is it? You know, you know how you do. And then a little while later, God began to speak to me. And he said, you are negative and critical. Joy has spoken the truth. God's pressed that in my heart. And I'm not kidding. That was one of the most difficult battles. I still haven't arrived, by the way. You could ask my wife. I have my moments. But that was one of the most critical and most difficult battles of my Christian life. To get rid of an evil spirit of critical negativity negativity it was so difficult God can change any of us if we want to be changed if we want to be changed so if you find yourself a Bob don't stay that way let God change your heart let God work in The Bob principle, the situation principle, and then the bedrock principle all lead us to this conclusion that we have to be trustworthy if we're going to build trust with others, if we're going to build relationships with them. So as I've kind of touched on all these things tonight, let me ask you a couple questions and, and I will close. First of all, are you trustworthy? Would your friends say that they can have confidence in you? Probably a question we should ask ourselves sometimes. Would people say they can have confidence in me? Can people tell you stuff and know that it's safe when they told you?
do you find yourself often putting situations before relationships when it's not necessary? Is everybody in your life cut off? You know what I mean by that, don't you? Is everybody in your life cut off? Why? And then, every time there's a problem, every time there's something negative, every time there's something critical, do they always run to you and tell you? Bob is a problem finder, a problem carrier. Bob just tends to have problems forming around him all the time. So the moral of that story is don't be Bob. Right? Don't be Bob. I know this is not very churchy. But is that where you find yourself? And if it is, why don't you let God change your heart? I am living proof that I know he changed me. And you're like, if he changed you, how bad were you before, right? Yeah, he changed me. God can change us. He can change us if we're willing to let him do that. But we have to want him to. I challenge you, if you find yourself struggling in these areas, make it a point of prayer. Begin to pray sincerely and earnestly about your issue. And ask God to change you. And don't stop doing that until he does. And he will. Don't be the guy who sees the the dark cloud that goes with every silver lining. Let's pray together tonight. As we prepare to close this evening, I want to ask you, right now to take advantage of the opportunity in a moment when we're quiet and we're not moving around, we're not talking, just quiet. I want you to ask God to search your heart and see if any of these things are present in your life. These struggles. Ask God to make you a person who's trustworthy, who's dependable, someone he can use to bring other people to Christ, to encourage other Christians, to build other people in their faith. Father, thank you that you love us and that you work in us every day. I pray that we would truly change our thinking because too often we overlook these types of things. We see them as non-essential, not important, when in reality these are vital. These things determine how we relate with one another inside the church family and also how we relate to the lost world around us. God, press on our hearts, our needs in these areas and change us. I'm thankful that in your grace you can change us. There's not one of us here that has to continue to be the way that we are in any area that keeps us from being who you've called us to be. You can change us and I'm thankful for that. And I pray that you will press on our hearts and help us to follow you diligently to see you shape and mold us into the people that you've called us to be. Use us to share the gospel with others this week. Help us to preach the gospel of Christ to every creature. We love you and thank you for the opportunity to be together tonight. We pray that you'll be with us now and go with us as we dismiss and use us this week for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.